Thank you so much. You know that I love the word and to be here behind this, which I know you never use. <laughs> Very, this means a lot to me that you would. I love to be behind the pulpit. I love to be under the word of God. I love to be before God's people. And so I don't take for granted the privilege of standing before this precious body of Christ that Louis loves so much and God loves more. So let's pray again that God would come and help me and you connect in the word. So Father, I ask now that as we are in this series of hope has a name and the name is Jesus, that you would deepen and intensify and strengthen and release hope in every heart in this place. And that the upshot of that hope, according to this text, would be a kind of compassion and a kind of courage that is willing to suffer for the name. So come, I pray, and do that deep, hard, glorious, beautiful, Christ-exalting work, I ask, through Christ. Amen. So as I understand the text we're going to be looking at, the theme over our time together will be the connection between hope and courage, or hope and compassion, or hope and love, or hope and sacrifice. All those pieces go together. Hope and joy, courage, sacrifice, love, compassion. That's all one package when Christ comes into your life. I know that, that I was listening to the message from last week, and uh, L Louis said, we, we want to shift our language from hope for to hope in, and that is hope in a person, not hope for a successful year. Nothing wrong with a successful year, it's just the wrong priorities, a bad strategy, he said, and he and I know both, and you know, that when you hope in Jesus as the ground of your future, he's also what you hope for. Louis's not denying that. He's just saying there's a lot of stuff to hope for that can preempt Jesus underneath and on the top and in front. So when you hear me today talk about hope, no, I'm saying amen. Amen, hope in, rooted in, Jesus, our only hope. You know, when you talk about a ball game, you can say, um, let's go back a generation. Michael Jordan is our only hope. No, no, no offense to anybody's team anywhere. Michael Jordan is our only hope. Well, that, what do you mean by that? Or you can say, victory is our hope. See the different ways we use hope? A person is the key. Or, I want to get this done. We're going to win this game. That's my hope. So there's no contradiction between saying, we're hoping in Jesus and the victory we hope for. I want to see him. I want to be with him forever. So that's my mental connection between last week and the beginning of this series. And Louis told me where he was going and what the, what the series was. He said, just do some more hope if you would. And I said, not a problem. Everything's on hope. Every verse in the Bible is hope filled. It's not a, not a challenge for me to talk about hope. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 10. If you have a Bible in your lap, that would be great. I'm gonna read it. Uh, I think they're gonna put it up here. But I'm gonna to refer to it a lot, and I don't know whether they'll be putting it up a lot, but uh, I want you to see what's here. I don't give a rip what John Piper thinks, and you shouldn't either, right? Fallible, human, fearful, inadequate, undeserving, crabby, <laughs> inadequate husband, inadequate father. What do you care? You shouldn't. You should care. Will he tell us what God said? And the only assurance you will have that I have done that is, do you see it in the book? Okay, so that's why I care about Bibles. Um, like on your phone, you got a Bible on your phone. Everybody should have a Bible on his phone. 
So get one of those if you don't have. Download it right now. It's okay. I'm all right with that. You version would work. That's free. A lot of others. Just get a, get a Bible. Carry it with you in your pocket. Here we are. Hebrews 10, 32 to 36. Recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings. Sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on the prisoners, the people in prison, and you joyfully, that's a stunning, off the charts, unexpected word here, joyfully accepted the plundering of your property. Since you knew you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, your hope, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that you, when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. The church in America, as I, at age 69, have watched her now for a long time, um, is slowly awakening from the distortion of about 350 years of dominance and prosperity in America. Let me say that sentence again, paradigm determining for me. The church in America, and I'm just thinking right across the board, no particular denomination, Protestant, Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, the church in America today is slowly awakening from the distortion of about 350 years, namely the length of our country, of dominance, distortion of dominance, and prosperity. What I mean by dominance is that in most American history, most of American history, until recently, being a Christian has been viewed as normal, good, patriotic, culturally acceptable, even beneficial. And what I mean by prosperous, 350 years of prosperous, is that by and large, being a Christian has generally resulted in things going well for you, especially in the South. I grew up three hours from here in Greenville, South Carolina. I'm a Southerner by birth. I grew up in the horrors of some of the stuff I'm going to be talking about in a minute. We're Christian in the South. We're Americans. And what I mean by distortion, the distortion of 350 years of dominance and prosperity is that this 350 year history of our dominance and prosperity has created a massively, deeply unbiblical mindset, namely of at-homeness in the world. hasn't been good for us. We are suffering from it, prosperous though we be. So we're dominant culturally and prosperous materially, and we've come to feel at home, it's our land, our culture. And the assumption is that it will go well for us here. This is our place. It's the way we do things, the way we think about things. We are Christian here. And we very much enjoy being thought well of for that. And we expect things to go well. 
and poverty and sickness and suffering and death are the worst things that can happen. And there isn't anything much worse. We expect this Christian land to be wealthy, us to be wealthy, us to be healthy, ease, upbeat, success-oriented, and we've developed a form of Christianity to support those expectations. Ingrained expectations. To be a Christian is to be accepted. To be a Christian is to be comfortable. To be a Christian is to be secure and to be prosperous. And that form of Christianity has focused mainly on how we feel and the needs, whether our needs are getting met. And then we, we sell this. We offer this to people, come and life will go better for you. It, by and large, in America for 300 years, the call to be a Christian has not been the call to be an alien. By and large, it hasn't been the call to be a sojourner or an exile or to be out of step. It's the call to be a respected citizen in the community. And we get angry, really angry. Watch it, watch it, it's still true. We're, we're only slowly awakening from this. People get angry. If you treat my Christianity as though it's not the norm, my views of things as not the norm, I get angry, you're taking away my culture, you're taking away my land, my history, get mad at you because I've developed a Christianity with assumptions that assume dominance and prosperity and normal and fitting in. This is our way here. You don't like it, go somewhere else. There's enough truth in that to give it some traction, right? If you, if you live like a Christian, you don't get drunk every weekend, probably you'll be more successful in life, right? You keep your job. Your marriage will probably go better if you're not home home drunk every Sunday night. I mean, that's true, and the Bible says don't get drunk. And so if you do what the Bible says, life goes better. The Bible says work hard. You know, if you don't work, don't eat. So if you work hard, then you're probably going to prosper in your business a little more. So be a Christian obviously brings success. It's just enough truth in this that it gets traction. The problem is it's just totally out of proportion. We have come to take all those relatively minor spin-offs of devotion to Jesus and elevated them above the massive, real pleasures of knowing him, loving him, and dying and being with him forever. It's everything's out of proportion in typical American Christianity. And this text fills me, it has for so many years, with a longing not to be a domesticated, comfort-seeking, entertainment-addicted, prosperity-loving, security-craving, approval-desiring Christian. I don't want to be that. It's abominable to me to be that. Don't want to waste my life just fitting in. So low. I want to be set free from this distortion. I want to be biblical. I want to have real, spiritual, otherworldly power on my life. I want to have stunningly countercultural, otherworldly hope driving this engine. So let's go to the text now and see what he says. The writer tells us, the church, recall the former days when, after being enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings. That's, what's enlightened in this text mean? So after you were enlightened, so if I said to that to you, after you were enlightened, this happened. And you think, what are you talking about? Enlightened, enlightened, when did it happen? This word enlightened is used two ways in the New Testament. It either refers to light that has come into my heart 
and given me a sight of spiritual reality, namely Jesus as King of kings and Lord of lords. That's the way it's used, same word, same Greek word, in 2 Corinthians 4, 6 that we talked on yesterday downtown. God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light, that's the word, give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. So this is a reference to their awakening from darkness where everything about Jesus was boring or mythological or irrelevant and light shined by the power of the Holy Spirit, perhaps in a service like this or reading their Bible or listening to something on their iPod and suddenly light was happening and Jesus was everything to them. He was just glorious and beautiful, irresistible. I'm just sold out now. He is my King, my Lord, my Savior, my friend. That's light. And, and I think that's probably what's going on here in verse 32, after you were enlightened. There is another use of the word in the New Testament. And it's the word of light coming out from you. I mean, I mean the English word enlightened doesn't usually mean that, and that's why translation is tricky. But when Paul says Christ brought life and immortality to light, that's the same word. Which means that to be lightened is not only to have light flowing in, but light flowing out. That is, I'm, I'm bringing light to the world because I have shown, I've been shown some things and they're changing me so that my very way of life, which you're going to see here in the next verses, is light. I am now more useful to the world even as I begin to be rejected by the world. That's happening in this text. So if you ask me, well, what does the word enlighten mean in verse 32? After they were enlightened, they began to experience suffering. My answer is both of those meanings are probably here since the word carries both of those meanings and they both really work here. This is a reference to their conversion. They're walking out of darkness into two things, seeing and showing light. Seeing light, I've been changed by what I see. Light has come into me and now you are the light of the world, Jesus said to his disciples. So that's my take on what lightened means. Now, what's the result in verse 32 of when that happens to you? And this, this, I mean, this is how out of step we are, how different things are from the early church in America today up until recently. Verse 32, but remember the former days when after being enlightened, you endured a great conflict, a struggle of sufferings. That was not unnatural. That's natural. When the light shines in and begins to shine out, people out there hate the light. Jesus said they hate the light, John 3. Which means that peace has largely been missing in American Christianity. Like, test yourself. Just see where you are on this. I'm just, I'm, I'm an American through and through. I mean, I have to prick myself, I bleed American. I know that as soon as I go across a culture, go to another place, man, I, my assumptions in my life are just so American. And one of those is that um, if you get really mad at me, if you get spitting mad at me, or somebody writes something ugly, my, my first reaction is, I did it wrong. I said it wrong. I must have done something wrong because if I were doing it well, I would be winsome. I would be winsome. People will see my good works and give glory to my Father. That's Matthew 5, 16. You know what's written just a few verses before Matthew 5, 16. 
Let your light so shine before men that they will see your good deeds and give glory to your Father. Amen, American way. We always are approved. Verse 12, Matthew 5 says, blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and say, say all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice. That's exactly what's happened in this text. So Jesus said, rejoice in that day for great is your reward in heaven. That's Hebrews 10, 34 in the mouth of Jesus 30, 40 years earlier. So one of my assumptions that's got to go is when I have light shining in and I begin to let light shine out, things are going to go well. Got to get rid of that. Sometimes they go well and sometimes they go badly. Both texts are there, right? They will see your good works and they'll give glory to your father. Many people are moved by the good works of Christians. Amen. Let it be. And many people hate the good works of Christians because of its roots and its branches and all of its implications for their lives. So the answer, what happens in the early church in Hebrews when you get enlightened, that is when you get saved, is that suffering often comes. If they call the master of the house Beelzebul, that's a name for the devil, Jesus said, how much more will they malign those of his house? Much more likely that you would get maligned if Jesus got maligned, and he did, he got crucified. Paul said in 1 Timothy 3, 12, all who desire to live a godly life in Atlanta will be persecuted, except in Atlanta where everybody's godly. No. This city is not a surprise to Paul, nor America, nor the 21st century. He said that. If, if there is no person finding your faith troubling, it's probably not showing very well. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, Jesus said. I didn't say that. Jesus said that. <laughs> Think it not strange, brothers, when the fiery ordeal comes upon you to test you. First Peter 4. We do think it's strange. That's a word for America. We think it's strange. If a fiery ordeal comes upon you to test you because you have stood for Christ and his truth, we say, something's wrong. I must have done it wrong. And the Bible is trying to help us wake up from this distortion and say, not necessarily. I mean, you might have been a jerk, but you also might have been faithful. So when they were enlightened here, how did they suffer? How did they suffer? Verse 33, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison. Verse 34. So they get two groups of people, right? You see those two groups of people? Some, because of their words or deeds or attitudes, don't know what it was, they suffered reproach, they suffered affliction, and they went to jail. And then you have another group of people who watch that happen and they have to decide, do we identify or not? Do we tell people, I'm, I'm one of them? Or just keep going. Don't, I'm not one of them. These folks, those are the two people. Sometimes being exposed to reproach and affliction and sometimes being partners, sharers 
with those so treated. So you're in jail here and you're identifying here. What happened to those who identified? Verse 34. You had compassion on those in prison and accepted joyfully, you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property. Can you get a scene in your mind? I've tried to picture it. What do you, what do you mean? What, what's going on here? So some are in jail because they have vocalized their Christian commitments, and others are not in jail who share those commitments, and it says they had compassion on those who were in prison. Now, in those days, you know your history probably. It's only recently that prisons are as um, comfortable as they are. In those days, probably, you, you didn't get any food in prison unless your family brought it. So, to have compassion on a prisoner would be, we, we got to identify or they're going to die or something terrible is going to happen. We can't keep ourselves cut off from these Christians. So, they have a little meeting and they pray, but if we identify, we might be in there. What about our kids? Our homes, our businesses. I mean, this is real. We, gotta, we, gotta, we can't just... And I know Martin Luther lived 1,500 years later and wrote A Mighty Fortress, but I think they sang it. <laughs> Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill, God's truth abideth still, we're going to the prison. I was just blown away as your leader stood here talking about the philosophy of this church behind giving. Compassion trumps. Consumption. That's the text. You joyfully accepted the plundering of your property because you had compassion on those in prison. That's the text. You prioritized compassion for the prisoner over the protection of your possessions. And so they went on their way to the prison and they looked over their shoulder and their houses are being trashed. Windows broken, Christian get out of town written on the wall, furniture being thrown out, computers smashed over their leg, all the hard drives with your lifelong journal on them in the fire. And what did they do as they looked over their shoulder? It's in the text. Tell me what they did. They rejoiced. You joyfully accepted the plundering of your property. Now that is so off the wall un-American. I want that with all my might. I want that more than I want anything. I want to be the kind of lover of Jesus, the kind of hoper in Jesus, in Jesus, that if to follow him means to have my goods plundered, it will make my day. That's what it says. It just says it. They joyfully accepted the plundering of their property. How you doing, Atlanta? How is your faith? How is your priority? How is your consumption peace and your compassion peace? Your Christ peace and your worldly peace. We are so enslaved to our comforts and our securities and our acceptance in a world that has gone haywire we can barely navigate anymore. So they suffered in prison and then they got their goods plundered outside of prison because they identified with those in prison. When they did this, where did they get that kind of courage? Where did that compassion come from? That's the next question, but before I ask it, 
Let's try to get real and practical here in America today. I stepped back and I said, okay, Lord, today, any corresponding situations to this in America, in Atlanta? And I thought of one, two, three, four, five. And they're all triggered by this very moment in my life. In fact, this moment in Atlanta and last Thursday and last Friday. And I'll just, I'll mention to you, you test whether you think these are contemporary experiences of the text because they are for me and I commend them to you. First, I'll just, I'll name them and I'll come back and talk about them two minutes each maybe. Ronnie Smith and Anita killed a year ago in Libya. Unreached peoples being talked about downtown. Number two, slavery, the end it movement, human trafficking, that's number two. And it's on my front burner because Louis, it's on his front burner. It's on the student's front burner, red X all over the place, right? So got to, what's that? Number three, Lecrae confessing his abortion in his new song, Good, Bad, Ugly. Randy Alcorn losing his job over the abortion issue. Number four, race. I saw Selma on Thursday night. I lived Selma. I was on the wrong side. MLK Day tomorrow, doing anything? Marking that day tomorrow? Change the world that I live in. The John Piper of age 19, 15, and the John Piper today are worlds apart on the race issue. And I'm so ashamed of the South I lived in. So ashamed. Me, I'm not talking, I'm not pointing any fingers. John Piper's language, John Piper's language was deplorable at age 14, 15, 16. My mother washed my mouth out with soap one time. Bless her heart. <laughs> and lastly, your mayor, I mean your fire chief. Okay, so let's, let's just come back to those. Because these, these are all so unbelievably real. Number one, Ronnie Smith from Austin Stone in Texas, 33 years old, loving the Libyan people, heading out there in order to bring compassion and love to the Libyan Muslim peoples. And he shot dead last December a year ago, leaving behind Anita and Hosea. So she now single mom. So put that in this text. I'm gonna go talk Jesus and hope to a people that are so un reachable because it's so against the law. I'm going to teach chemistry to make it happen. And he gets thrown into the prison of death. And his wife, because she's so supportive and ready to stand with him, she loses her husband. That's a pretty significant property to be plundered. So I met with her last Friday. They're making a movie to try to help you and all of us understand what it costs to reach the unreached peoples today. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about unreached peoples. Louie and, and Passion are down there trying to, last night, I guess, raise money for 10 unengaged peoples. Amen. Praise God. Louie, that's right. And it'll cost these students their lives. Do they know that? They do know that. Louis knows that. It will cost them their lives to reach the peoples that remain. They're all in hard to get at places with people who don't want you to come with good news. They don't think your good news is good news. You know, don't you, that when you sing these songs, I mean, just take two phrases, blood of Jesus, son of God. I saw both of those on that screen up there. Blood of Jesus, son of God. You know, don't you, that even in this country, you use the phrase blood of Jesus, namely, God sends Jesus ordains that he be put to death, that you might go free from all your guilt and all your sin. There are people who call that divine child abuse and think you are wicked for believing that. So right at the heart of our faith, 
are people who would call themselves Christian, who think you singing that song is evil. They strip it out of all their songs. It's blood talk. Or the term son of God. Try that in Syria. Try it among the ISIS in Iraq. That's what will happen to you. God doesn't have babies. He doesn't sleep with Mary and have children. You call him son of God, you're dead. And here we are singing it with our hands in the air. Do we know the world in which we live? Are you ready, America? So to, to love the unreached peoples, whether they call it love or not, will cost your property, your husband. Second, slavery, You're doing that, red X, end it. Yes, human trafficking, end it. Christ is on that, that end it. And if you get close enough to the real power brokers, in Venezuela, you're dead. You touch our multi-million dollar trafficking, you're dead. You're going to stay on the movement? Red X, bang, make my day. Yes. We're not playing games here. This is not a comfortable movement. If you think it's a comfortable movement, you're out of touch with the world. You're just a little teeny southern middle class, I fit in kind of Christian. Third, Lecrae, bless his heart. What would it cost him? How long did he think about writing that song that he had an abortion with a girlfriend? Now, now he's got to tell his wife. He's got to tell his mom, and he's going to sing about it in order to call all of you women and all of you men who have done the same thing to call you into the light of forgiveness. Because it's a sin to kill a baby in the womb. I hope, I hope for the day when the safest place is the womb, not the most dangerous place. And so here's Lecrae summoning with his song and his testimony into life. So I met with him two weeks ago when I was here. Let's put this so much on my front burner to be sitting right beside him as we make this video with Lecrae and have him tell me what it was like to deal with his wife on this, what it was like to deal with his mom on this. That's how going public means. That's how getting things out of your dark soul works. Such freedom because of Jesus. And Randy Alcorn, I love Randy. You know, the guy who wrote the book on heaven and got eternal life, eternal, eternity ministries, something like that. Um, Randy and I and thousands of others started here in Atlanta. 1988, 1989, sitting in front of the abortion clinic saying, no, no, end it. End it. We don't kill our children in this country. Oh, yes, we do. But we said, no, end it. Randy has so many injunctions against him. He had to quit his job because they were going to garnish his pay. He had to resign his pastor. He's been living on minimum wage ever since in his structure that he's set up because to this day, he would be called to account for that kind of investment. We will have our goods plundered. It may cost Lecrae. Fourth, Ferguson, Eric Garner, and now the movie and tomorrow, MLK Day. How can I not, how can I not say, it cost Jimmy Lee Jackson his life. It cost James Reeb his life. It cost Viola Liuzzo her life. And five years later, three years later, it cost Martin Luther King his life at the Lorraine Hotel in Memphis. It was not cheap to stand and believe that Christ calls us to racial and ethnic harmony, diversity, justice. I don't know how it is. I don't live, I don't live in Greenville anymore. I live in Minneapolis. Race is the biggest issue in Minneapolis. 
Over and over again, the inequities crop up. Don't think this is a north-south kind of thing. It's a human issue. And, and then don't think America, think tribal animosities that take out millions around the world, right? Ethnic hostilities, almost all hostilities in the world are ethnic hostilities. We, we have it so narrowed down to our little, little paradigm in America. We think black, white, and fix some laws. And this issue of human beings hating other humans who aren't like them is so endemic to our nature. Nothing should be clearer but that the church doesn't buy that. The church, they hope in Jesus. They find their identity from Jesus. And whatever color or ethnicity they are, they are in Jesus. One hope, one church. So it's just huge. And it will cost you. Because I don't care how many wonderful laws have been changed in the last 50 years. There are people saying snide, dirty, low down, demeaning things behind others' backs at the place where you work to this very day. And how you respond to those slurs and those jokes and those prejudices will cost you. And then lastly, Kelvin Cochran. There is no such thing, according to the Bible and God's perspective on things, there's no such thing as same-sex marriage. Whatever the world says, whatever the Supreme Court this year decides, it doesn't exist. One man, one woman, in covenant, displaying Christ and the church till death do us part, is what God says marriage is. If this other thing happens, we're just not going to call it that. And then add to that this. What if you believe with all your heart that 1 Corinthians 6.10 says that those who live without repentance in same-sex relationships of a sexual kind will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And you have devoted your whole life to helping people get into the kingdom of heaven. You're not going to celebrate what keeps them out. You're not. And when you don't celebrate it, you're toast. Your plundering of your property is going to happen. Your job will go. Your bakery will go. Your photography business will go. It will cost you to love the sanctity and beauty of the marriage God offers the world for their good. It will cost you because it will not be called beautiful. So if you were to ask me, is this text... In the world today, is it in America, is it in Atlanta? I'd say, well, in five ways it is. Unreached peoples and the cost, human trafficking and the cost, pro-life and the cost, racism and racial justice and the cost, and the beauty of and the sanctity of marriage and the cost. So it's pretty plain for me that this text is relevant. Where does the courage come from to be a Christian? Of compassion and courage and sacrifice and love when the world is not agreeing with any of that. Where where does that come from? And the answer is in verse 34. You You joyfully accepted, joyfully accepted, joyfully accepted. The question is, where does that come from? Because joy is the strength that is carrying the day here. You joyfully accepted the seizure of your property since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. The most important word in that sentence is since. Or it could just read knowing that you have because it means since. Let me read it again slowly. You joyfully, put yourself in here now. You joyfully accepted the plundering of your property because... 
So if you ask me, where does this joy come from? Where does this strength come from? This courage come from? This sacrifice come from? Because you knew. You Christians know that you yourselves have a better possession and an abiding one. Hope has a name. The possession has a name. The better and the eternal has a name. His name is Jesus. We hope in him. We hope for him. The better and abiding possession. Paul said, for me to die is gain. I am torn. I want to depart and be with Christ. For that is far, what's the word? Better. That's the word. Far better. To remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Got that? Do you believe that? To die is better than living. Paul did. These people did. That's where the joy came from as they went to prison. That's where the joy came from as they lost their property. You joyfully accepted the seizure of your property means your hope in the better and abiding possession is so real. These aren't just words for you. I would ask you, are they words for you? Are they realities for you? Is your possession beyond the grave more precious than anything this world offers? If it's not, you won't live like this. That's what 350 years has ruined. It has made us at home here so that this world is more precious to us than that world. Thank you very much. I don't want to go yet. Stay away. So I'm not going to the prison and I'm not going to say anything or do anything that would make this life, which is my real love, uncomfortable. Nope, not going to do it. Notice the two things in verse 34. Abiding, it's an abiding and it's a better Abiding and better, abiding and better. Better means this life is inferior, that life is better. Abiding means this life is temporary, that life is forever. My favorite verse in the Psalms is Psalm 1611. You show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Do you hear those two words? Fullness of joy, pleasures forever. Does that sound familiar to verse 34? Better and abiding, better, full, abiding forever. I just, let me throw this out. Anybody who can come up to me after the service and authentically, genuinely, truly offer me anything better then full and abiding joy in Jesus, I will stop being a Christian this morning. I invite you, find me or email me, john.piper, desire and God. If you can offer me anything better then full and forever pleasure in Jesus that's real, not made up, real. I'm done with Christianity. I am done. The reason I feel so confident and that God is honored by what I just said is that not only can't you do that, you can't even conceive of it. It is inconceivable that there's something fuller than full. And it is inconceivable that there's anything longer than eternal. So I'm totally safe. You're not coming up to me afterwards. (laughs) Unless there's some spooky 
physicist out there who got the world in a circle, you know, and time, I don't even know what I'm talking about. I mean, this is what, if there are a lot of you probably who showed up this morning, didn't have a clue, and you're not a believer yet in Jesus. You're just searching and wondering what's it all about. You need to hear me say that this hope that Louis is always talking about, this church believes in, and that can drive your life to be the most compassionate, the most sacrificial, the most risk-taking, the most loving, the most countercultural life on the planet, that hope is full and forever. And there's nothing fuller than full. These people have found what every human being is looking for. I don't have any doubt that every human being in this room is looking for the very best happiness and the very longest happiness. Happiness that peters out on me after 80 years, no thank you. Happiness that could be improved upon, I want the other one. Everybody on the planet by God's design wants the best happiness and the longest happiness. Only Christians know this, it's Jesus. Jesus died to get that for sinners. You may sit there saying, well, there's no way knowing what I've done in my life as a sinner, I could ever be the beneficiary of the fullest possible happiness and the longest possible happiness in Jesus because you don't know the crap that I have done in my life. And I say, oh, yes, he does. Oh, yes, he does, which is why this church loves to sing about the blood of Jesus because it was so infinitely costly that it can cover the very worst of lives and invite people out of the darkness of failing on every one of those five points. Failing on every one of those five points. Into the light of full and everlasting joy. So, in conclusion... As you enter this series on hope, I'm so excited for you. As you enter this series on hope, namely Jesus, got a name, as the psalm, Jesus the psalm and the apex, the highest experience, the fullest experience, the longest experience, as you enter on a series on hope, I pray that the God of hope will release this church, this city, the church in America, release a tidal wave of Christian compassion and Christian courage as you bring hope to the broken and lost people of this city, as you bring hope to the lost and broken, unreached, unengaged peoples of the world, as you bring hope to the enslaved people who've been sucked into this massive, threatening machine of human trafficking, as you bring hope to the racial issues of the city and the South and the North and the world, as you bring hope to the sanctity and the beauty of God's plan for a Christ-exalting, church-displaying marriage. I pray that as you move into that kind of amazing release of hope, God will do. Verse 34. So Passion City Church, may God cause you to joyfully accept the plundering of your property because you, you have a better possession and an abiding one. So Father, please, I I'm, I'm, know I'm preaching above myself, to myself mainly. I don't want to be simply a people pleaser in this world that's gone so awry that it will enslave its little girls and kill its unborn and strip marriage of its meaning and mess up race relationships and leave people in the darkness of lostness. I don't want to just be a part of any of that. I want to be so satisfied by Jesus that I am free 
to let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill in Libya or anywhere else. Your truth abideth still, full and forever. Jesus, in his name I pray.